time, we both secretly thought, oh my gosh, are we going to leave our kids for orphans? Because if we didn't have our two Silicon Valley jobs, you know, we were a month away from having to sell our house because uh, we needed cash flow. And, you know, we have kids coming up to college. It was a very, very dark time. So finally, you know, I test positive for Lyme disease. I'm crying all the way home and because uh, he says, hey, uh, that test is bad. Uh, and um, so you don't have Lyme. We gave you that test, but we don't believe it. And so then I go home and I s research on the CDC website. And I say, hey, wait a minute. It's a two-step process. If I test positive for this first disease, they need to test it for the second. And I called them back up and they go, oh, 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 I guess we forgot that. And so then I tested again. It was positive. And they said, they called me into the office and said, they basically fired us as patients. They said, we don't have the tools to treat you for that disease here. And this was the infectious disease department. Wow. At a, lar at a large university. So uh, I was crushed. Uh, long story short, we found a Lyme specialist through Lyme disease support, support groups online, and they connected us with a really good doctor, and we were on our way. I mean, it took us, you know, I would say six months to a year to be fairly functional. It took us five years, five plus years to be feel like 100% normal. It was a long, wow. long haul. A lot of it was we didn't just have Lyme disease. We had a secondary parasite is babesiosis, which is like a red, a red blood cell disease like malaria. And it's they take different sets of drugs. And it's a little bit like whack-a-mole when you get multiple tick diseases. You know, you, you treat yeah. one and the other one flares. It, it's, it's more of an art than a science right now, treating it. Yeah, and it, <clears throat> well, because it, like you're saying, uh, it, the source of Lyme disease is ticks the the bite of a tick and typically just like any any mosquito born illness uh any parasite born illness really you're you're bound to have anything from uh any any disease from either the parents or even the host that the parent fed on um and of course anything that they've fed on since so yeah, it's it's a long, long list and litany of things, uh, especially and, 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 once you're talking a, about a compromised immune system from something like Lyme disease to begin with, things that you would typically be able to fight off, you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, and it's a really big problem and growing. So a couple of weeks ago, the CDC published some new case numbers for Lyme disease, and they upped their estimate by quite a bit, and they said it's like, 476,000 cases a year now. Uh, you know, that's like wow. about 1,300, an average of 1,300 new cases a year. It's been reported in all 50 states. That's where you live, not necessarily where you contract it. And, you know, there's no end in sight. It keeps growing, and we still don't have a reliable test in the beginning. Just like that doctor said, it's not reliable. You yep. have to take it multiple times. And... You know, so it got me thinking, like, how how come this disease is so incredibly screwed up? So I started researching, yeah. and I said, well, what we need is a documentary. So I teamed up with a really talented documentary maker in Marin County, and Andy Wilson, and we launched on a five-year project to do a, a dramatic documentary on Lyme disease. And um, five years later, it was a semifinalist in the Oscars uh, under our skin. And that was really yeah. uh, a stake in the ground that helped a lot of people understand really why the disease is so controversial and political and what patients need to do to get treated. Well, and let's start getting into that uh, now that we know a little bit of the backstory, the back history, uh, how you came to be involved with <clears throat> this horrible, horrible uh, disease and illness. Like I said uh, in our pre-show, um, I myself have connection with Lyme disease. I don't have Lyme disease. I am not a sufferer. Um, but my ex in Maine, her mother was. And uh, that was one of the first times that I really started deep diving and finding out information about some of uh, the biological programs that were going on, uh, things like uh, Plum Island Research Center, 
um, uh, the the cases of Lyme disease whenever it first started coming out in New York, Pennsylvania, things like that. So uh, let's really start backtracking now and uh, start from the beginning of Lyme disease. Well, and uh, I have to say when we were doing the documentary, one of the last interviews we did was the discoverer of Lyme disease. Oh, wow. And his name was Willie Bergdorfer. He uh, was the guy who dis- uh, discovered the causative bacterium, Borrelia burgdorferi. It was named after him. And he went public with that in 82, 1982. And, and the NIH and public health said, yay, he's a hero. We've solved the Lyme disease problem. And so the public story is, oh, you can treat Lyme disease with two to four to six weeks of doxycycline and it's cured. And if you're still sick well, you're just a hypochondriac or you're just suffering from the aches and pains of daily living or you have some sort of autoimmune thing. So, well, uh, you know, that was the story. And when we did the documentary, there were some rumors of maybe Lyme disease was escaped from Plum Island. That was a uh, bioweapons lab for uh, killing animals during the Cold War. And so when we sat in on that interview with Willie Bergdorfer, we were setting up lights and camera, and about 45 minutes into it, we got a knock on the door from someone at the BioLevel 4 lab where Willie used to work. He was retired then, and he says, I need to uh-huh. sit in on this this interview. Uh, you know, so he was basically saying, I, I need to, you know, be the minder of this interview. And the yeah. director said, no way, no way. So that set up this real tension that there were stuff that Willie couldn't say. And sure enough, when we turned the cameras off, Willie said, I didn't tell you everything was sort of a sly grin. And so, but we had to get the film out. We did that. I was done with that. And and then uh, we didn't go down the bioweapons alley because it just, we knew we could never get that funded for the film because it was an indie film. So I walked away from it. And then it's like something happened. Well, two things happened. And uh I couldn't walk away from the Lyme disease problem, which is was is and was far from being solved. <clears throat> I was at a family birthday party, a large family birthday party. They had birthdays one day a year for the whole family. And there were two people who weren't in the family, and one of them was sort of like a grizzly guy. Uh, he looked like he was ex-military, and he was at the kitchen table slamming down drinks. And so I said, oh, what do, what do you do? And he goes, well, I was with the company, the black ops of the CIA. And so he spent the evening telling me these stories. Oh. And after his, like, uh, Apocalypse Now series of stories in Vietnam, he, he pauses and he goes, well, you know, the the weirdest thing I ever did was I dropped weaponized ticks on Cuban sugar workers in 1962. <laughs> and, and my jaw just dropped. He, I mean, he had no idea that... I'd just been researching Lyme disease for five years, and it was just unbelievable. But I, I, I would say that was the beginning of the book bitten that I wrote, and I didn't know it would be a book then, but I kept on bringing him more drinks and going into the bathroom taking notes about all these crazy details about his Cold War ex- escapades with ticks. And, um, and later on, I would use those notes in the book. So that was the first thing. And... I shoved that aside. I was I got a job as a science writer at Stanford in the med school, which is fabulous because I learned a lot about science and biomedical things. And then uh, I get a call from a documentary person who also interviewed Willie, and he was screaming and he was driving away from where Willie worked in Montana at 80 miles an hour saying, Willie just said that he thinks the outbreak in Lyme, Connecticut, it's sort of in the lake, uh, start, well, they noticed it in the 70s was due to bioweapons work he had done earlier in his career. So that was when I knew, well, this is a big story because this is a huge secret. First of all, that Willie Bergdorfer worked for two decades in the biological weapons program. He later told me he um, tried to turn fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes into weapons. He was sort of the bug guy on that team. Um, and then that he believes that the outbreak of crazy tick-borne diseases, there were three of them in the late 60s, 
of a, a scary thing in the 70s into the 80s, uh, he, he says that that was due to some accident gone wrong in the biological weapons program. He didn't do many details, so that was enough to start a five-year research project that ultimately end up, ended up as my book, Bitten, that sort of explains this crazy Swiss-German scientist who came over in 50. He got sucked up into the insect-borne weapons program, such a secret program, more secret than the man, or as secret as the Manhattan Project for nuclear development. And then I just went into um, how he got sucked into the project, the, the U.S. experiments got darker and more dangerous without, with open-air experiments and not much oversight. And then Willie, at the end of his life, he got Lyme disease, and he started having empathy for the patients and eventually talked to, you know, a couple journalists, me and a couple others, and, uh, and let the information trickle out. Are you there? Oh, sorry about that. Uh, that is <laughs> often the case I I with these scientists that have worked in these fields that have done this kind of stuff. That, of course, they, they spent years and years doing it, uh, doing it for the right reasons at the time, um, but realized that things went far off the rails somewhere. Uh, and typically have their... Uh, be it a deathbed confession or even even, you know, as the... As you were saying, whenever the documentary was being filmed, that the handler showed up uh, and and was, hey, you know, uh, we gotta we gotta make sure that nothing that he that he says is beyond any non-disclosures that he had. Yeah, because they all took um, a secrecy oath. Oh, and absolutely. As, as I've interviewed people who were there, the witnesses, a lot of them take their secrets to the grave. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a lot of work to get some of the information out. And then, you know, I went to uh, many, many archives to try and get the old paper records. It was like putting together a hundred, I mean, a hundred thousand piece puzzle, I would say. Wow. Wow. And, and the documentation that you have come across that you have on your website, uh, chrisnewby.com forward slash documents, is where you can find these folks. I have them all up. We will, of course, be adding them to the Knowledge Vault as well. Um, I mean, we, we go into agent tables, uh, all kinds of stuff here um, that is that is really pretty decent documentation about <laughs> um, these kind of programs or, and their existence in the past. Yeah, um, there... There have been a lot of books in the past about some of the insect, weaponized insects. There's Plague and Fleas, which Willie worked on, and uh, Yellow Fever and Mosquitoes. But you know, the things that sort of my, the new territory that my book broke was, you know, first of all, the person who was heralded as the Lyme disease discoverer, his involvement in all those insect-borne uh, experiments that I mentioned, and that they actively weaponized ticks. So he would take ticks in the very beginning and he would shove little glass pipettes down their mouths and put disease agents in them. He he was doing sort of trial and error, error granimals to try and match a disease with a, a given tick and then the people at the bioweapons headquarters in, in Dietrich would see which combo of diseases and insects suited their military objectives, you know, because sometimes they wanted a really deadly insect combo, germ combo. Sometimes they'd want something that was just chronically incapacitating. It would be a, a multifaceted plan to disable the enemy, to destroy their economy. Yeah. You know, just like, just like with Cuba, let's, let's make the sugar cane workers sick and It'll starve the people, and they'll revolt against Fidel Castro. Yeah. Well, and because that was one of the many, uh, many things that was done. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of scary once we start talking about biological research, uh, especially in the climate that we are in now. 
uh, with with the big C word roaming around out there. Uh, vaccines, of course, that have that are coming across seem to be doing a decent job. Uh, but much like our guest John Hall and I have talked about, like we can get ready to see numerous variants. We are already seeing that. Uh, just about one per country it's landed in. There is a variant. So, like, it's it's pretty textbook, um, some of this. And some of the, and even the, even the scalability of things, whenever you look and start reading the documents, like what I have up on screen, talking about, you know, uh, this document specifically entitled An Evaluation of, of entological warfare as a potential danger to the United States and European NATO nations. Uh, so actively a study done to see what the what the viability of such things would be and what the spread numbers would be. Um, yeah, one of those documents that I find particularly appalling is that they calculated the price per death of various strategies of bioweapons agents. Yeah. So one of the agents they used was tularemia, which can be tick-borne. And what they, uh, you know, uh, beginning, beginning of the 60s, they said, oh, we're not going to mess with live insects. We'll just take the germs we were putting in the insects and we'll brew them in large stainless steel vats like you would beer with yeast or whatever and sure. brew them in mass quantities and freeze dry them and aerosolize them. And then we can spray them with crop duster like things over battalion size areas or cities even this is so, incredibly affordable even for 1974 folks or 76 this is 76 uh planning 87 five uh eight eight thousand seven hundred fifty dollars not horrible um a agent production uh, just over the cost of planning, actually, 10000 just to produce the biological agent itself. Uh, munitions acquisition would be 9897 That would be uh, delivery systems, that kind of stuff, you know. Um, and, of course, weapons employment, $5,700 for a total of $34,347, folks. Um, or a, a dollar thirty-three per death by tularemia. Yeah, what a deal <laughs> that like, they put a wow. price on a human life for a dollar thirty-three. And lucky there, and, we're talking about attack with yellow and yellow fever, infected mosquitoes, um, and the 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 viability of it. What what size? Uh, approximately twenty-two thousand two hundred. Uh, like, wow, the numbers are staggering. It's crazy. Yeah, and the the danger of that is, you know, that was against the Geneva Convention, which the yeah. U.S. didn't sign. But, you know, nowadays we know you can't control nature like that. There's always blowback, That's you right. know. So um, one of the things I was hoping the book would do would be to prompt the government to re release a lot of the classified documents on what things – what biological weapons they tested in what areas and what protective research they did for our own soldiers because they would i mean there was a long process to weaponize a germ like tularemia sure. uh, you know you, you you'd have someone like willie do some experiments try to mix and match it with insects or figure out how to keep the bugs alive and then you would have dietrich do pilot small pilot studies you would do open air tests in dugway utah of live agents which is 50 miles as the crow flies from Salt Lake City, Utah. And then uh, then you might do a couple pilot studies in foreign countries like wow. Cuba. Yeah. No. So there's just – in Cuba, that's 50 miles as the crow flies from Florida. And yeah. And, of course. Yeah, that, that could have been dumped by Cessna. Yeah. Like <laughs> – and even, even – to know that, A, uh, of course, that our government explored programs like this, explores programs like this. Um, and, and, you know, to know that we, we were looking at aerosolization of 
this kind of technology. Um, that is that is pretty incredible. I know. I, I can tell you. I, I think the experiment that most was most jaw dropping to me because it really uh, has impact on the Lyme disease outbreak that started started to be noticed in the late '60s, and that is the radioactive tick experiments. So what happened there is a small, ambitious researcher in um, at Old Dominion University in in uh, near Norfolk, Virginia. He got an Army and Atomic Energy Commission uh, funding to take Lone Star ticks, make them radioactive, and then release them over months to years and see how far they would crawl in that time. And, you know, the military objective of that, which is, of course, buried down low, is that if they drop poison ticks on the Soviet Union or in Vietnam, they want to know how far their weapon will spread over what time. So, he, you know, he did that, and he would take a pregnant tick full of eggs and inject it with radioactive fluid, and then the tick would have 2,000 to 3,000 little nymph ticks hatch, and they would remain radioactive for the rest of their life. Then he would put little canisters of 1,000 ticks in uh, meter squares, like, you know, a couple hectares of meter squares, and he would release a thousand in each square, and then every month he'd come out and he'd collect the ticks in that square. He'd take them back to the lab. He'd use a Geiger counter to see how far the radioactive ticks had traveled. Then he would take all those ticks from that square and put them back in the original square. If he collected adult ticks, he would paint the backs of them with fluorescent paint, and he would, you know, wash, rinse, and repeat that for months to years. So. The reason why that's so egregious is that, first of all, you don't know the lab ticks were completely clean. Willie said there's no, no such thing as a clean tick in that yeah. even if you grow them in a lab, what do they get? And then what combos of disease do they get You know, when they're out in the wilds? And then the most outrageous thing is he released them on the Atlantic bird flyway. So they were picked up by birds and you know the birds, the co- the seabirds go from South America up through Canada, and the tick he he was experimenting with was the Lone Star tick, and I call the Lone Star tick the Terminator of ticks. Oh my gosh, it's the only tick in North, uh, North America that has eyes. So instead of just waiting on a blade of grass to bite you, it can stalk you and swarm. Yeah. And it also, the saliva of the ticks gives some people alpha-gal allergy. That's an allergic reaction to red meat. Huh. And then, to add insult to injury, that tick is the one that carries Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, which is the most deadly tick-borne disease, and it was on the bioweapons list for a while. And so, you know, a year after these open-air tick experiments happened, all of a sudden... You know, up the coast, Long Island, is when there was a huge outbreak of deadly Rocky Mountain spotted fever. At the same time, Lyme showed up. At the same time that uh, Babesia, this red blood cell infection, showed up. So, you know, my hypothesis, and, you know, scientists need to prove this, but the timing is right that this deadly outbreak of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is spread by the Lone Stars, was... Uh, it it was ignited by this open air experiment over these years. Wow, wow! And, and uh, up on screen right now, I have more of this document showing Operation Big Itch, uh, where they used fleas. Um, Operation Big Buzz, where where they were uh, dropping. Uh, oh God, I just lost it. Um, mosquitoes. 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 Yeah. They would. They, that was an interesting story. That had been published in other books, but in Big Buzz, they um, they dropped just thousands and thousands of mosquitoes in yeah. poor African American neighborhoods in Florida and Georgia. And then they had a military people dressed up as public health workers and putting little mosquito traps in people's houses and stuff. And then they would go from house to house to see. Oh, you know how many mosquitoes that they had released were there. They were not infected mosquitoes, but still, yeah, they were the mosquitoes it, that it, carry dengue and Zika. And you know, did they upset the natural order of 
of mosquitoes sure. species. Well, yeah, because you're going to have some loss within that migration. You're going to have some loss within that. You're, of course, going to have some that stick around. But that's really the only way for you to get a propagation number, you know, like how many, what was our effective propagation into the local population of mosquitoes, you know? Right, right. It's just a pilot study where so, we didn't know we were the guinea pigs. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, and uh, that's just it, to know that these things have happened for so long. And, uh, you know, we talk with Dr. John Hall regularly about, targeted individuals, targeting technology, uh, things like that, where, yeah, there is literally no law that prevents the federal government from experimenting on the populace or its contractors, mind you. Um, So it's it's kind of frightening to know that. Um, And it's kind of frightening to know that, yeah, they have come into our backyards. They have released these things on purpose to test their uh, effectiveness, so to speak. Yeah, and the bioweapons program was officially and it officially ended in '72 with Nixon. But it's there are lasting impacts on the environment from that those experiments, sure. uh, and even when they were releasing simulant bacterium uh, that they thought were harmless, in some cases they weren't harmless. For example, there was a Navy ship that sprayed a simulant uh, in the 50s off San Francisco. Just a boat sprayed this uh, Serratia bacteria up and down the bay. And then they measured it and said, yes, it spread across the whole Bay Area. They thought it was harmless, but all of a sudden uh, intravenous drug users were starting to get these red bacterium in their uh, in cultures and Actually, one guy who had a compromised immune system died at Stanford oh. Hospital. And then they did that in the New York City subway system. Uh, th- at that time, the biological weapons program was competing for dollars with the nuclear program, and they wanted to prove that, oh, we're at risk, so we need to do all this defensive research. So <laughs> one of the CIA g- I g- guys working uh, at Dietrich, that's the biological weapons uh, uh, headquarters, he filled a light bulb with live simulant bacteria and he went to new york city and had a team of about 20 uh, military or cia military people to help him with this and as the subway rumbled under the sidewalk he smashed the light bulb uh, it in the grate in the sidewalk and then and then he had all these people stationed all over the new york city subway you know some one of them had a a camera case that was actually uh, a sniffer. Uh, there was a woman with a purse. Uh, the guy who uh, was in charge of it had, uh, let's see, a camera that was a sniffer disguise. And then they determined, well, if this was anthrax, we would have you know, made a significant percentage of New York City sick. So give us money so we can figure out how to protect the country from something like this. Wow. And, and you know, um, when you when you start looking, especially at uh, many of the many of the terrorist attacks that have happened over Mm -hmm. the last many years, uh, the gas attacks that happened in France, all that kind of stuff like that is the kind of stuff that is targeted, Um, even if even with the spread of Corona. Um, if you notice, the, the cities that were hit hardest first were the cities not only with large populations, but they were cities with large populations with standard mass transit systems, subways, train lines, things like that, where you had 100 people crammed into a car at a time in a tunnel and everybody else waiting in a tunnel, you know. Um, things like that. Those were the cities that were hit first. So to know that, yeah, they were out testing the efficacy of this and the spread and use of it in uh, in in subway tunnels in New York is is not a surprising fact at all. 
Yeah, and you know why it's important that we learn about this cold, this really dark Cold War history, and we declassify those documents is so we can learn from history. That's right. So we can think about, oh, we're going to genetically modify mosquitoes to protect us from Zika, but let's not just do a really large open air trial, which they did. You yeah. Know, let's be careful about it. And then the other thing is, you know, we released all these things, and obviously we released hundreds of thousands of ticks that were non-native and they're sort of taking over the native tick populations and and they sprayed things in pilot studies so can the military please declassify that so we know uh we know what to test people for don't just say oh these all just spawn three freaky new tick-borne diseases all of a sudden showed up in the late 60s around long island let's and then it also started in Wisconsin. Let's hear from the military what they released where so we know what to test people for now because obviously yeah. when they spread them, they're picked up, they're breathed in by bunny rabbits and mice and birds and spread to the ticks and mosquitoes. So, you know, we need to understand what happened. Well, precisely. Uh, not only that, but we we need to understand um, the – their process for what what was the plan of action for like unmixing the Rubik's cube after you solved it Jack you know yeah. like after you figured this out do we have a do we have a current course of action to undo any damage that might be done you know um, did you did you even consider coming up with a course of action? Uh, were these were these programs where it was like um, we're just going to do damage and it doesn't matter if we have to do cleanup, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. We we'll have the the known loss numbers and we can send our guys in after and well yeah we'll just lose a percentage of them, you know? Yeah. Uh, and even that even that thought to know that. Uh, I mean, there's always, of course, a casualty number whenever you're talking about war or any kind of operations. But to know that there is an allowable, just like, yeah, uh, we know that this number is going to die. This isn't even a a possible given. If you walk into this infected area, this is going to happen. Yeah. And, uh, you know, anybody who's had Lyme disease knows that the the disease tracking system is broken. Mm -hmm. And when coronavirus hit, it really broke in a very visible way because there were body bags. I mean, the casualty rate was huge. The parallels I see between the Lyme epidemic and and the COVID epidemic are, it was the failures of the CDC. They had, in the beginning, they've had bad testing. With Lyme disease, we still have bad testing. No test really works reliably in the first month. We have fragmented disease tracking. You know, we're just getting our contact tracing together with COVID. And with wow. Lyme, we still don't have it together. And then the, the CDC was, hasn't been keeping up with sort of the evolving symptom set of tick-borne diseases. Because it's not just one tick-borne disease. You, it's not like one person and one disease. It's You can get one to four. I've heard of people getting five diseases from one tick bite or multiple tick bites at the same time. Oh, sure. That, that's, that's what they do. Heck, that's a heck of messy symptom set that isn't in the textbooks. That's why you need an experienced clinician to, to be your guide through that nightmare. Yeah, and sickness. unfortunately... Uh, unlike people that you meet on some strange dating app, it's not the fact that you can ask a tick where they've been. You know? <laughs> know. There's a, know. there's not that uncomfortable conversation, you know. <laughs> of, uh, oh, you're safe too, right? Like, you practice safe things? Like, no. Um, they are pretty indiscriminate. They do not care what they bite as long as it has warm blood. Well, I, I think the the most fun chapter I wrote was the first chapter, which I had a writing instructor, and he said, you know, why don't you write this first chapter like mm. Jaws? So if you go back to Peter Benchley's <laughs> Jaws, the first chapter is from the point of view of the shark. Yep. And it's the cold precision, the magnificent Darwinian evolution that has brought this perfect killing machine 
you know, in contact with humans. And so that's what I did. I, I just said, I just did the first chapter was written by a tick, basically. It's the point yeah. of view of the tick. And it's terrifying. And as I researched it, it just made me want to throw up, you know, because, oh, my gosh, ticks are so clever. I mean, the way they can crawl, why they can, they have no eyes, but they can sense the CO2 that your body emits. And yeah. they can just, they have little, like, velociraptor grappling hooks on their front legs. Yeah. I've... And you just brush by them and they hook hook on. And then they can creep up, and then they'll they'll find a place to hide your your belly button, your armpit, your private parts. In my case, it was yep. below my hairline oh. or above my hairline. And then they they just have these like uh, I don't know, it's like uh, these these little shovels that quietly dig a little hole, and their saliva makes the the skin numb, so you don't feel it. And then they they release from their saliva. Um, an anticoagulant, so you just don't scab over. Yep. And then they just their <laughs> bellies start like contracting like a bellows, and they they lap up the blood. And and then the worst thing is they release a chemical in your bloodstream that suppresses your immune system about a week. So whatever germs are in their bellies are going to be in you. Yeah. Gets a head start. Wow. Wow. And and you know, like you said. Uh, through the research done, um, really finding that not just the the perfect host, but the perfect species amongst the perfect host that would carry this, carry it properly, and carry it effectively. Yeah, yeah. And now uh, I know that we have we are coming up on an hour uh, that is normally as long as we keep first time guests uh, if you would like to keep okay. talking we'll gladly keep talking um <laughs> but i also understand that uh people have lives so uh <laughs> well uh, here in the last couple of minutes i would like to kind of wrap up um number one uh as as a reporter as someone in with the history of that um do you find a lot of this stuff being covered into the in the news period um and i guess also is are these programs still active uh, no i mean since 72 we u.s officially hasn't been doing biological weapons and you know we have a defensive program yes and if you have enough agent to create a defense against some of these germs, then if you wanted to turn it to an offensive program, it would be fairly easy. That's called, in the jargon, the dual-use program. <laughs> but we have better ways of killing people these days than live organisms. So I think they're probably working on other weapons, but that's also secret. I can't even get, you know, 50-year-old documents from the government so there's no way i know what's going on now oh yeah yeah absolutely and and you know even just to know that um with with everything going on with coronavirus things like that that yeah we we even outsourced our gain of function research here in the united states um we, of course, said that, like, oh, we weren't doing gain of function. Well, no, we weren't technically, but we were definitely funding it. Uh, <laughs> so, and it's just strange that, uh, yeah, we outsourced bat virus research to Wuhan, China. Um, strange things, strange things like that, where, yeah, we don't have active weaponry programs anymore. But the like you're saying, the... The technology to weaponize it is pretty readily at hand. Yeah, and we just need a better way to track these new diseases. Yeah. I mean, we obviously botched the COVID outbreak. A little bit. Well, I mean, you we're got, trying to recover now. You got to admit so that we, it exists we, first. That's yeah. helpful. Yeah. <laughs> like, even well, foreign now, and nations now, and, and national bodies outside of our country, like international bodies, have to admit it's existing first. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's a big that's a big issue. You can't obfuscate that. 
Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, um, with with a couple minutes left, uh, of course, one question that begs to ask is, how how are you? How is your family? Are y'all well <laughs> now? Everybody okay? Um, are there regular lingering effects from the Lyme disease that you suffered? I've been really healthy since 2010. My husband has had a couple relapses, oh. which is frustrating. And then he, around Halloween this year, he got COVID and he was, mm. uh, he he's fine, but he's, I would call him a long hauler now because he doesn't have his taste or smell back, Oh, which is, which is, he's a guy who enjoyed a good glass of wine, so that's very frustrating for him. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, uh, you know, must be heart-wrenching for your family to still be going through the issues of one and have the other come up. Um, yeah, especially since my husband, I mean, a lot of men are like this. They're tough guys. They don't want to see the doctor. Plus, when you've been sick this long, you get PTSD. It's yeah. like, oh, no, you just please don't, don't to send me doctor. to another doctor. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I know. exactly. But, it, it, you know, I would say if people think they have Lyme disease, a really good website is LymeDisease.org. It's very patient-focused. There's their symptom checklist, where to find an expert in your neighborhood. And then there, uh, um, if you pull an engorged tick out of you, uh, save it. Don't yeah. flush it. Yes. Like put it in a little plastic baggie with a, a very damp little piece of yep. uh, paper towel and Google where you can send in your tick and get it tested. And the great thing about that is there are some really good labs that will sequence the DNA of everything inside that tick. And then you'll have wow. a head start wow. on what's in it. And you can take that to your doctor and say, you know, if you're not sick, uh, ignore it. But if you start getting symptoms and take your doctor and said, hey, I had spotted fever and, and Lyme disease in this tick, uh, will you test me for it? Because the the Lyme disease test does not work reliably in the first two to three weeks. It's an antibody test. It's indirect. Wow, that is and and that's frightening um, to know that we and that that's just it to know that we have known about Lyme disease as long as we have known about it is e- even though rare. You know, even though the doctors are like, oh, you don't have Lyme disease, it's so rare. Like, you'd be struck by lightning twice before you had Lyme disease. You know, um, things like that. There, There's still nothing really there that is dependable. And that's what's kind of frightening. Yeah. And if you compare it to AIDS, which was that... Uh, that same window hit the public the same year. Yeah, we have now for a- HIV AIDS. We have a you can go and get an over the counter saliva test, and it's fairly reliable. Like ninety two percent, you can know yeah. if you have it at home instantly. But with Lyme disease, you have to make a doctor's appointment. You'll get abused for saying it's a rare disease, even though it's in fifty states. Yeah. Then you have to you have to take two tests. You probably have to go to the doctors twice, and it takes weeks. And by then, you might have a really entrenched neurological uh, infection. Yeah. So we can do better. I know we can do better. Exactly. And I want to thank you so much for coming on this show. Um, oh, you are more you. than welcome to come back on any time. I would love to have you back on to talk more about your research into the world, the biological weapons programs, things like that, because so many of these um, <clears throat> scientists tend to work in similar areas. They sit, they tend to work in similar projects. They run in the same circles, you know. Um, so these programs cross paths, uh, let's just say. And once again, I would love to have you back on. Uh, oh, thanks. I let, would love to come back on. Let everybody know, uh, of course, other than dudesandbeer.com forward slash store, where they can go to get your book, bitten the secret history of lyme disease and biological weapons chris it is time for shameless self-promotion okay well any place you get books you can get bitten amazon or barnes and noble or your indie bookstore it's in stock mostly and there's kindle and audio for people who want to listen on their drives 
there, I would recommend if you think you have Lyme disease to watch my documentary. It's called Under Our Skin, and you, if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, you can watch it for free. Oh, and, wow, fantastic. Yeah, and, you know, it really shows the patient experience, and it helps it, it helps you to see if you have symptoms similar to those people, and it, it may, it helps explain to relatives what you're going through, because it's not just you. It makes you feel less alone, I would say. And then I would, get, if you want to see some of the creepy Cold War pictures of the biological weapons program, I would recommend you go to my personal website, chrisnewby.com, under the images. And I just, all along, I collected the images. They're just very Dr. No, Cold War, uh, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, it is It is very, uh, very much that Dr. Strangelove feel once you start, like, seeing the and i'm popping some up on screen right now once you start seeing things like the the rats ready for biopsy and you know the the large um chambers and things like that with the with the measuring devices attached to them like it's it, i'm not gonna lie kind of jealous uh <laughs> that's the kind of facility i want just not for those horrible horrible things <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I, I would say the story the story is not dry history. I tried to make no. it like the hot zone. It's a narrative nonfiction. Yeah. I tried to bring Willie alive and really have you understand what it's like to go to work and put plague in fleas and then come home to your new babies and think, wow, <laughs> this, this is weird. <laughs> you know, yeah. how, do you, how he got sucked up into it and how he redeemed himself in the end by letting out some of the truth anyways. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. Please do hold the line while we close things out. Okay. Uh, while you're online checking out chrisnewby.com, make sure to stop on by dudesandbeer.com. That is, of course, where you can get all the episodes. That is where you can get the app to listen to episodes live, post-play, whatever. Uh, make sure to stop on by the HC Universal Network. That is our home network. Great shows like Yes But Why podcast, Talking Sound podcast, Richard Spazov show, Scary Dad, Kicking or Sticking Fantasy Football. Great wrap up to the Super Bowl guys, by the way. Um, until next time, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and remember if you can't be good, be good at it. We will talk to you soon. Uh, bye bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Dudes and Beer Podcast. To listen to our audio streams or chat with us live, download the official Dudes and Beer app for Android and iDevices, available on Google Play and iTunes markets. For more episodes, content, and information, visit us online at dudesandbeer.com. You can also find our episodes on Breach.tv, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. Dudes and Beer is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more about our sponsors and other podcasts on this network, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, drink responsibly.